give it away, give it away, give it away, give it away now. He's still, now he sings on every Give it away, one. give it away, <laughs> give it away now. I passed the mic. Okay. He's that, just, every yeah. single one now he sings. Yes. Red Hot Chili Peppers. When was the last time we got down to some of that, dude? Oh, they had a, a new album a while, like the last year or something, right? Really? Yeah. I, I yeah, feel yeah, like yeah. they're the, one of the most bad. I feel like they're one of the most underrated. Oh, dude, bands. one of the best funk they rock are. bands. They dude. are. I honest. think they're underrated. I think they're awesome, but they're. I think they're legendary. I don't know. I mean, they'll be in the Hall of Fame. Wait till they die. Once they die, what was it? They're so legendary. Weren't aren't they another one of those bands that uh, did their own label and went on went their own way? Maybe I think so. I think Mm -hmm. that's part of the reason why they are so underrated. Is they're not? I don't know this again. Too. They're like Pearl Jam. I was looking for Justin to save me on this because I just (laughs) sometimes I lead out there with things that I think I'm right about, but I'm not sure, and I'm hoping that the other two guys know more about this. This was one I was looking to Justin. He looked at me like I don't know, but I'm going to go with this. Okay, let's do this. I think so. I think that the Red Hot Chili Peppers are up there with one of those bands that said, you know, fuck the major label, we're going to do this on our own, and they became still super big, but they would have been probably even bigger if they would have. I think they're, I yeah. think they're legendary. Uh, it's April. Speaking of legendary. It's April. And Speaking of legendary, we talked about the legendary fucking sale that we're giving away. Well, this, uh, this is- Legendary. Per- I don't think we've ever it's given almost away- mythical. I don't think we've ever given away- This much. This much stuff. Ever. So if you enroll in the MAPS RGB bundle or the MAPS Super Bundle, you get three things for free. You get the No BS six-pack formula for free, the fasting guide for free, and the nutrition survival guide for free. You get that all for free for enrolling in either one of those bundles. Now, Plus 50% off the forum. Oh, that, and that's nine months of fucking training that includes the MAPS Prime program, right? If you get the Super Bundle. If you get the MAPS I mean, Super you're Bundle. you're pretty much set up forever. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's it's basically it's all everything you need. You got the nutrition stuff, the fasting stuff. You've got stuff for working out your core. And then you've got... You know, three different main programs with your additional programs like Map Any- Maps Anywhere and Maps Prime, which is you're done. I mean, if you cycle through those those different Maps programs, you're pretty much good forever. A lot of people don't know this. You guys can get onto the website, click on the Learn More button on each one of the programs if you want to hear details of what each one is. So I know Sal kind of goes over them on the on the episodes all the time, but a lot of people don't fully understand what each program is. Like if you want to know more detail, the distinctions, you go to the details. website, you yeah. hit lear- learn more on the actual program, whether it be black, red, green, prime, whatever you hit it. And then there's actually a nice video that will pop up and a description of whatever thing. So if you want to know more detail, excellent. This is at mindpumpmedia.com. Again, to recap, enroll in the RGB bundle or the map super bundle, get the no BS six pack formula, the fasting guide and the nutrition guide. Absolutely free. Again, mindpumpmedia.com. We're also giving away some t-shirts. Here we go. 20 reviews. Okay. Tw- what? You know why? Oh, that's good. It's an uptick. That's because I called it last time. That's I have right. to tell exactly. people. That's exactly. I, yeah. No, it's not because I called Come on, it. Come guys. It's not because I'm magical or something. No, I know. It's because we have you to- brought it up. We have to literally tell people how to leave a review because Apple yeah. can be a cock. It's a little bit of friction there. They can be a cock. Um, so here's how you leave a review. Don't say that. They'll, they'll shut us off. I love Apple. Okay. They're great. Yeah. Go to the podcast icon click on it search mind pump even if you're subscribed you have to do this long arduous process search mind pump click on the icon when it comes up you'll see a little section where you can leave a review if we like your review you'll win a free mind pump t-shirt doug take it away Yes, and I always have to remind people we like all the reviews, but we like some more. <laughs> so these are the six people who are winning this week. We got Andre D. Davis, C. Bass Fishing, Lizette 41. Kick his ass, C. Bass. <laughs> Flex on Fleek. Marty Love. No, sorry. Mandy Love, 16. Oh, that's right. a difference. And our Maybe. final winner is going to school to be like Ben G. Excellent. Oh, all of you are winners. Is that Ben Greenfield? Absolutely. Yeah. That's how he learned about He's our show. Awesome. So thanks, Ben, for sending them our way. So uh, send the name, the one I just read, to mind, iTunes at mindpumpmedia.com. Send your shirt size, your shipping address, and we'll get that right out to you. If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. Do you think when you meet people who do like lots of, not addicts, so let's forget addicts because those are actual, but people who like to really enjoy doing certain drugs and you meet them, do you think it's the drugs that make them weird? Do you think the fact that they're weird is what makes Mm. them seek out drugs? Mm. You know what I'm saying? 
That's an interesting question, and it's kind of hard. To, I don't know too I many think interesting people gravitate towards it. Well, not just you know, interesting. Well, you know, you know who'd be a good person to talk to about this is actually Brink because he has because he does drugs. No, 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 because no, because he has a close relationship <laughs> with buddies who he remembers one side and they've had a complete shift. I, yeah, I don't have any. I don't know anybody close to me that I know that like didn't fuck with any of that stuff, and then all of a sudden they did, and then now they're super hippie. You know why like I that. say that? Because like there were. Like if you do a study on uh, marijuana, for example, or alcohol, you'll find that a, a, a disproportionate percentage of people who drink alcohol and smoke marijuana compared to people who don't have higher rates of depression. Now you can look at that and say, oh, marijuana and alcohol cause depression. Or you could look at it and say, depressed people are self-medicating with substances that make them feel well, better. Well, I thought we already kind of figured that out, don't mm -hmm. we? We know that already, don't well, we? Well, I don't I mean, it might be both. No, I don't you know think what I, mean? I don't think that's the case. I think I think any time the, the reason why I'm saying this is I'll meet people who do like uh who love psychedelic substances and we've been meeting a few of those people recently and they're a little eccentric, you know what I mean? Not mm. in a in a bad way, but it's a little different. And it makes you wonder, like, is it did that did that happen because you dropped hella acid, or is it because? Well, I feel like I, I I guess this is one of those things that I have an experience, and maybe after I do, I can I can speak uh, more educated on it because I feel like a, uh, right now we're going off of our experience of meeting people and talking to them, but I've never done a psychedelic dose, and I feel like I'd have to do a, a few times before I could go like, okay. I get it now. I get why these guys talk and they act this uh -huh. way. My, my thing that I always ask, and if you, I mean, when we were with Kyle, when we were with Jamie, like we were Aubrey, like I'm always asking these guys, like, w where's your checks and balances? Like, where do you, which I thought right. was cool that he talked about he'd on a calendar. But you, then you met, remember when we talked to Kyle, like Kyle didn't even know what the fuck that was. So, you know, I think so, so many people, they get so excited when they get introduced to this and this, you know, it's so enlightening and you yeah. get this experience and then it's like you chase that. And then w how is that any different than any other experience that we're, we're chasing? especially when you're talking about it's not the, the argument is that it's it's you're like supposed to be just like super present, right? You're so present that you're so in tune with this almost other world or out of body experience but then are you really or is that really disconnecting from yourself now and are you chasing that disconnect just like somebody who's getting high on something else or mm -hmm. drinking alcohol and which are trying to escape from the current reality that they're in right now i i you know in my opinion is i think uh we have a tendency to categorize things as either good or bad mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying so mm -hmm. it's like yeah. on one hand you're like you know of course the you know how we were raised don't right it's all bad just say no don't do any of this stuff which is really hard to break you know that that sort of stigma that that surrounds a lot of this kind of stuff and yeah. I, and i think that, i think that's why it's what we're trying to figure out because like we've met so many smart you know like really uh, productive, uh, you know, influential people that we're finding, you know, have these experiences and, you know, they have a different way of looking at a lot of this, this kind of stuff. And it's, it's interesting to me, just, just if they like thinking of it more as a tool, as opposed to like, I'm chasing a high mm -hmm. or I'm trying to, to seek, uh, like an altered state of consciousness, just, just to, you know, just to get like, you know, away from the world. Well, it's uh, it's because the three of us. The one thing that we all three have in common is anytime somebody comes and says to us, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be a supplement, it could be a type of workout, it could be a diet, and it could be a drug. Um, when people come to us and say, "Oh my God, this is everything. This you know, this is the greatest thing ever," and then they start to really strongly identify with it. The yeah, three, we pull back. We always do. Yeah, yeah. I'm always like, "Whoa, well, like, yeah, let's yeah. let's uh, dissect this." Yeah, a little and bit. we do we Pump do that. Breaks. We do that with keto. We do that with supplements. We do that with workout routines. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what I mean. I think people like to be like a either all or nothing right type of you know <clears throat> camp, and I don't think anything works that way. But I will say this: when it comes to to drugs, um, you know, if you look at like like methamphetamine, right? You look at meth you'd be hard to find an average person that would say, oh, yeah, meth's got some good. There's, <laughs> there's some good properties. In however, a meth before breakfast. However, we sell, we, we sell it legally as a prescription drug. I mean, 
Uh, methamphetamines are sold uh, as ADD medication. Uh, you know, pilots will use them to stay awake. The military will, will use them. So there's there are some beneficial uses, some potential beneficial uses for even a drug like meth, right? Or substances that are like meth. But then you find out like Hitler was on meth. Yeah. And you're like, dude. He was. Dude. Well, the irony in all that is that people don't Cautionary even- People don't even really realize that. Like, you know, if you told me- like, you know, when we are going, like, you see kids, like, like, how many college kids are taking Adderall to get them through studying for school? But if you, that same kid who does that, right, the the rich kid who, you know, mom and dad have taken him down to get the prescription so he can study better and, and, and you know, breeze through school. Uh, but then what if the same parent or different parent takes his kid and they can't afford to do all that, but they can get a, you know, bag of crystal meth on the corner and they said, okay, son, you know, just wait on, on test days, you oh can, here's, you know, he gets his pipe ready. I mean, right? Like, you know, you know what? That just sounds so. You're ready for your SATs. Yes. Like, that sounds crazy, right? That sounds yeah. so crazy. But how far off is it, though, really? Well, they'd have to make a different uh, form of it. I don't know if you could do study. I don't know if you could study. Like, yeah, I think, I mean, they're both. <laughs> you imagine think, that? Think about I'm it. Just though. picture. No, I hear what you're saying. Right. right, right I totally right. hear what you're saying. No, it's. Um, like we need to ace this. We need to get you in this. <laughs> Ivy League school, <laughs> you're gonna smoke this rocks. <laughs> like, what, the, like, what are you? Uh, what, how did or your, if there your was, kid's GPA jump like fucking four points? Like, what's like, going oh on? Oh my god! Uh, let Performance me, gain. Let me, let me show you his nootropic stack. <laughs> you know, or vitamin you, C, vitamin B12. Or uh, if you fell off, math. you fell off the monkey bars and you broke your arm, and your parents go, you know, well, let me uh, come here. Let's tie that off real quick, and we'll shoot you up with some heroin real quick, and <laughs> wow. we'll fix that right up. Little, little kids. On yeah. The floor. <laughs> well, it's you know nobody nobody. It's it's so funny how we, uh, we 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 demonize, we categorize, we name them drugs. It's like oh these are so bad. But then the government puts like a cool little label on it, colors it like a blue color, and yeah. you know, gives it a different name. And then right. it's totally okay if your doctor prescribes it's it. Weird. I just got some Prozac Cheerios. Right. It's yeah. just. Really- it's gonna happen. Watch. <laughs> I mean, all of it. All of it's a tool, right? All of it can be utilized as a tool, and like anything else, it can be abused. I and just I think. I, I just think, like anything, like what we talk about when we talk about diet, when we talk about uh, exercise, or you know, which are things that we, I can say, we're experts in, right? We um, we rarely ever tell people, uh, you know, don't ever do this, and always do this, right? Like we'll say, there's foods that are definitely not good for you. Um, we're not going to lie, but are we going to sit here and say never, never, never eat them? No, because it doesn't work. When you do that, when you do that whole black or white on the wagon, off the wagon, you get um, – it, it's not effective. You actually get more – probably higher rates of abuse is what I would think. Like, Don't you think it would make more sense to be yeah. – Well, we're, aren't, uh, more – like just to educate and be more honest about it? Like instead of telling – like here's a good example. Well, it's right? hard to moderate anything. Well, here's a good example. We've told our kids for a long fucking time now, at least for a few hundred years, that sex is bad. You're going to go to hell. Don't masturbate. It's evil. Has that been effective? Have kids like not had sex? Has it, does anybody not you know jerk off because they were told it was bad and it was a sin? Where is no. it, Where is the statistics on jerking off? What are the statistics? Yeah, is it, is it an increase? Are we increasing that? Well, who's going to de- fill out that form? No, there's studies for that. Doug, That's you should Google that. Or Taylor, you should Google no, that. Well, uh, the, the- is masturbation on a rise or is it on a decline? <laughs> I have my theories. What yeah. you, I think it's on a rise. No, 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 no. But it might be declining. We did a whole Ooh, episode on the, the declining male, right? Because mm-hmm. people are becoming desensitized. Here's the problem with here's the problem with masturbation. Is well, let's <laughs> here's the one problem. Is, with- yes, your one problem. It's, it's a gonna, plethora. It can get you in trouble in a lot Here's, of ways you can't do it in public that's yeah. about it no here's no, no, the problem no, it's the equivalent of getting like super obese before taylor or doug gets this out i want to know off. i want to know no, here's what here's rise what, rise or decline what no here's why i'm going to say there's a problem no no no. you don't, rise you don't have decline. accurate you know you can't you can't we have accurate do this numbers. by like a boner what do you mean, meter what do you, mean you can't have you accurate you don't have accurate numbers because in the past uh, it, nobody would ever answer this properly or, or they would never answer it honestly or it was never asked so sure these studies hey can the just- kinsey reports were some of the first studies to to actually ask this and they were done in the 1940s 
before and and even though that's plenty of time. I don't need to know all the way beyond before that. I don't need to know medieval times. I just want to know in the last like, is it on the rise in the last twenty years, bro? That's what all I need. They to know. Whack off. It's been it's been times. tracked for that know. for longer than that. I you know I've been a part of you know I've been part of one of those studies, right? So every, Whoa, what every year you've been part of that study? Every year I get somebody who tracks me down, no matter where. Oh I've lived, yeah, every, my wife has been on some of those. Too. Wait, hold on. So, yeah. This is getting weird. I, I can't even. This is so bad. I don't know the name of the company yet. I've done this so many times. They ask you how often or many times you. Okay, so like I when mean, I was. Not a masturbation they found me study, when I was. They found me when I was about fucking ten or eleven. I can't remember. Somewhere around there. And what the fuck kind of organization is this? <laughs> so listen. <laughs> okay. Hey listen. kid, um, have you played with yourself? Listen. They ask me questions, questions like this. They ask me questions like this. Mm-hmm. So this is how it works. So about I, how many times do you get wrecked? I get paid a hundred dollars. <laughs> Right, and they paid you. Yeah, yeah they they pay me to take the study, and I'm a part. Of, and and it's uh, we're gonna set up a one way mirror. <laughs> no, it's not that crazy, but the, uh, it's always somebody that works for this company. They come out. It's not a company. It's like it's like a uh, what do you call those? Like they're like these okay. national. What? Are, yeah, it's a survey, but it's like a national. Oh, I was gonna say pervert, yeah, 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 but yeah. Right. market research. <clears throat> yeah, I put headphones on. I got a laptop. It's all private. But they ask me. I mean, they get into like drugs, my sex life. They want to know all these personal questions, mm. uh, and and they and they pay attention. I mean, they could come see me every single year. So like, I remember. Oh, so they're, they're watching you for a long. Yeah, time. they were watching me for a long. So of course, when they're asking, when I'm like 12, and they're asking me, have I done these drugs? This, that, I remember being a kid, and being like, God, no. Like, and now, wow, this as is I've older, I go like, oh shit, I got to ask yes to this now. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah. Were now. you honest? <laughs> have now, you yeah, tried you know, the finger in the butt? Maybe. Yeah, I am honest. I'm honest. So when they ask you when you're 12. They say it's anonymous, right? So they're not gonna they're not right. gonna put my name on it or anything like that. But they email it to your mom yeah. right after. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> She's got the print out. Yeah, it turns into blackmail. Yeah. Like you're gonna pay us now. Okay. Son, uh, what were you doing in the bathroom yesterday? Yeah. Uh, nothing, uh, mom. That's not what this it. report says. Uh, during the current National Masturbation Month, I look. Oh, there's a there is a masturbation month. That's stupid. Oh, we missed it. <laughs> Let me. I don't know. Maybe we didn't. Let me find out here. Oh, good. I looked into how close to truth this old joke that 98% of people masturbate while the other 2% are liars. Michael Kassman writing the Psychology Today says that a fairly large survey conducted by University of Chicago sociologists find that only 38% of women said they'd masturbated at all during that that past year. Wow. The figure for Come men. Come on, ladies, let's pick it up. The figure for men was sixty-one percent. This is bad study. Has to be that the study suggests that there are some misconceptions in the U.S. about this practice. Uh, in American culture, masturbation is often viewed as, viewed as a sexual refuge for singles, as a way to compensate for a lack of sex in a relationship. In this survey, they turned out not to be the case. In both genders, a sexless re- relationship suppressed masturbation response respondents who masturbated the most were usually involved in a sexual relationship having partner sex it appears uh peaks interest in solo sex finally sex involves both physical and emotional cl- uh, closeness in this study any disconnect between these two elements i.e physical contact but no emotional closeness or vice versa was associated with increased masturbation in fact for women one of the best pre- uh, predictors of masturbation was a re- relationship that lacked emotional I- intimacy. So, guys, if you guys are not asking how your woman is doing and her feelings and sharing your feelings, chances are she's masturbating to somebody else when you're not home. Wow. Dang. Just food for thought for Dang. all you guys. Give this explains this explains bump. why in the U.S., where people seem willing to reveal all manner of intimate details about their lives to almost anyone, masturbation is still something that they seem to be a little secretive about, perhaps because of the it's, false perception of that those masturbate do so because they think it reflects I, badly. Yeah, I take those surveys own. with a fucking grain of salt, dude. I mean, I'll tell you why. I'll, I'll tell you why right now. Please do. There's now There are now studies where they're studying people's <laughs> internet searches, and internet searches- <laughs> That's where it gets real interesting. Internet searches, like you're in the heat of the moment, you're searching for what you want to look at yeah. and they are not matching up with what surveys are saying uh, directly so that's the thing like when people ask people surveys number one there's a bias because who are the kind of people that agree to these kind of surveys number one it's not everybody like it's not everybody that agrees sure sure it's not gonna be super accurate but you think it's that far off do you think that I think you take it with a grain of salt. 100%. Well, I think I think something I think I go I know where you're going right you're going that like if someone asks you about like uh, you know what type of porn you look at, and what things are you, what kinky shit are you into? Like, there's some weird shit out there that I'm sure a lot of people are. I think depending on my uh, my sex, depending on my religion, the way I was brought up, 
a lot of those things are going to determine determine how I'm going to answer a question like that. Mm. Um, it, so I, I just think nonetheless, I think you we can still speculate whether it's on the rise or or decline. Don't you think that you can still speculate that just because there's surveys out there? Of course, I think no. because masturbation ha- happens. In, on your own when you're hiding and no yeah. one's around. I, so I the think search results are a little more like, okay, we're peering into people's actual activities versus like what they portray themselves yeah. as being. Also, what do you consider masturbation? Do you consider- Clown porn. Do you, <laughs> whoa, whoa. <laughs> do you consider masturbation like till you orgasm or is it just a uh, manual stimulation of your genitals because you like the way it feels? Oh, well, that doesn't count. I play with my balls and dick all day long. Whoa. Wow. Hey. That's like a, wow. It's, uh, you don't? All what? Day, all day long? You don't? No, I don't play with your balls and dick all day long. <laughs> no, your own? Oh, my own? Maybe. Yeah. You know, because we're men, because we're guys. It's kind of a thing. You know, like boys. It like never you're, leaves. You're, you're always, you, from the early, like as soon as you start to le- you learn how to pee on your own, you touch it. You know yeah. what I mean? It's on yeah. the outside of your body. I'm still upset. So we're like, we can't we're just pee on trees anymore. Yeah, like that's a problem. It's kind of irritating. Yeah. You still do. What are you talking about? I know. But that's in, in the confines of my own property. I don't know how we went that's from here. I don't know how we went from psychedelics to masturbation, well, but somehow we got they there. They go hand in hand. It always happens. Yeah, I don't know how yeah, we you got there. You haven't noticed that. Yeah. I, I nonetheless though, I think that all these things are tools, including masturbation. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that uh, I'm not I'm not a fan of uh, demonizing any of that stuff. In fact, I think it's even more funny when I know people that are um, like freak out about the, oh we just like, made a thousand people squirm like yeah psychedelics or drugs and it's like oh my god that's so bad but then like they don't they don't care about their crazy addiction to carbohydrates it's like you can sit here I can sit here and argue with you all day long that it's just as dangerous there's different they should have different thresholds but you can they, you can argue that there's more people that are dying from that than are dying from any oh, of those of course, drugs. Of course, well, you, oh, cool. yeah, but everyone just says, oh, of course, and they just mow on over through it like it's no big deal because hey, I can get away with you know taking more carbohydrates, taking in more sugar, taking in more of this stuff without seeing this crazy. Oh, I'm gonna die. It's the next just day. not. It just you know why? Because it's like publicly, it's not as like crazy. Like if you're if I'm at the store and I see a bunch of like really overweight people. I'm not thinking like, oh, fuck, I got to get out of the store. But if I go into a store and like hella people are tripping hard on acid, <laughs> I'm going to be like, wow, I need to get the fuck uh, out of this. Yeah, now. but you know what? It's if, just one of those things. Yeah, but here's the thing, though. If, every, <laughs> if everything was legal, if everything was legal and everybody could trip balls if they wanted to, like that wouldn't last. Like you wouldn't like you would have to you it would require you to have respect for all of these things of course you would and i think we would have this even playing on all things right I you would start so. to look at everything all the same and just say that hey some of these things are much stronger than others some of these things have much greater adverse effects than others and therefore i have to learn to respect them all of them can be used all of them can be uh enjoyed but then there there you just have to learn the balance of all of them and understand that. And I think Anarchy that, 2018. Yeah, fuck, dude. Yeah, Come on. Bring the bird. Right? Bring the bird. Yeah. Psychedelic masturbating bird. Today's quad is being brought to you by Chimera Coffee. It's the only coffee that is infused with all natural nootropics for a cleaner, calmer, and more focused buzz without the crash. Click the Chimera link at mindpumpmedia.com and input the discount code MINDPUMP at checkout for 10% off. It's the motherfucking qua. The eagle has landed. Quee-qua. Our first question is from Spam Rice and Eggs. Excellent transition right there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> like right in. <clears throat> How can an athlete gain functional muscle mass unlike a bodybuilder? Ooh. So... Functional muscle mass. Uh, first off, uh, resistance training will build muscle on your body. Yeah. Regardless of how you do it, it's gonna. There's you gonna. You can be, define it however you want. Yeah. There's gonna be muscle a muscle building effect from training with resistance. Functional muscle. We have to put that in context. First of all, a bodybuilder is actually very functional. Well, and all, for bodybuilding, technically all muscle is right, functional. Right, right. I mean, a bodybuilder has got very functional bodybuilding. He's muscles. just taught it different things. Exactly. Yeah. So, like a bodybuilder goes into a gym and does bodybuilding movements. He's extremely functional with what he's trying to do. He's more functional than an athlete is. Like if an athlete who can do crazy sports goes into a gym with a bunch of machines and dumbbells and stuff like that and tries to do. A routine like a pro bodybuilder, 
they're not going to do as well in the routine as the pro bodybuilder with that bodybuilding routine because the bodybuilder's got very functional muscles for what he's taught his muscles to do. Right. Now, if you're defining functionality as, you know, big muscles that move in multi planes, that move uh, for everyday life, that are yeah. have good pliability, good flexibility, that there's no deviations there's no you know no there's no restrictions like you got full range of motion like you know that kind of mentality and i think that's obviously what they're kind of yeah. alluding to it's just that you had to define that because it is like it's still functional muscle but like it really just amounts to what you're teaching your body and what you're teaching your muscles to uh to, to provide like the action towards so mm -hmm. Um, and if you look at some of the like the staple bodybuilding movements, uh, the ones that we advocate quite a bit, like overhead presses, you know, barbell squats and deadlifts and rows, pull ups, dips. Yeah, you if, see that a lot in in your your everyday life as oh, far yeah. as picking stuff up, carrying them to your car. You know, do it like it's just functional in that sense of it is more like it's it's daily applicable things beyond just just lifting weights in a stationary kind of setting. I mean, if you did those movements and you constantly focused on control, improved or increased ranges of motion, tension, you're going to get more functional for most things. In fact, uh, you know, I hate the whole, you know, weight, lifting weights makes you tighter or makes you lose flexibility. That's not true. Uh, it's the way you lift weights. If you lift weights and focus on full ranges of motion and constantly challenging that with good control, most people will get better uh, flexibility and ranges of motion. Most yeah. people are going to get uh, <clears throat> better mobility. I mean, I, I, every client I've ever trained, you know, we didn't even do stat, like lots of stretching until much later on, and they got better range of motion because we would constantly challenge it with weights. Mm -hmm. I actually think this is something that uh, we tend to overcomplicate. Um, and I know this is a, a, actually a very popular question, because there's a lot of people, and I'm, and I'm sure Justin for sure, Sal, maybe you, uh, maybe when you're going through jiu-jitsu, uh, but most everybody that that's into sports and that's a young male or female coming up, uh, you are also wanting to build and shape your body, but then you also love sports. And I mm -hmm. think that's where this question stems from is like, how do I build this physique that I'm, I like the way I look? But then I also am functional and can play my sports that I love to play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, to me, it's a very simple. I mean, we can get here and talk semantics all day long and make it sound really complex, but it's this simple. It's like they they both have their advantages and they both have their disadvantages to to each. Right. So, you know, if you're if you're solely focused on aesthetics and that is a, the main thing, I just want to build this great looking body. Well, if you build your routine around that and that's how you train all the time, then it's going to start to hinder sports performance because you're not doing a lot of multi-planar movements. You're not doing explosive. You're not doing stop go. You're not recruiting different types of fibers, really. Like there's these, these different things that are going on when you're training specifically for sports and when you're training specifically for just building muscle mass. And so when I like talk to a young athlete, I just normally look at them like, well, where's the priority? And that's where we're going to spend most of our time. And we're going to be kind of 80, 20 with it. Right. So like yeah. if you're like an athlete and that's priority first, but then you also would like to look good. Well, 80% of our time is going to be around like sports performance type training, like map screen, like map screen is like, this is our world. This is the type of movements. This is how we're going to train because this is your primary focus. That doesn't mean that 20% of the time I'm not going to take you and we're not going to do some heavy deadlifting and do some heavy squatting and build some muscle. Like, But I want to make sure that I'm still spending a majority of your time in this multi-planar, functional, full range of motion, explosive type training that's going to benefit your sport. And the, the other side is true. Like, let's say you were someone like me who was – coming up in the later 20s and going like okay I'm no I'm not going to be a pro basketball player but I love to play basketball and I and I and I'm part of a men's league and so I still want to be functional I still want to be able to play the game but I care the way I look more so then 80% of my time was spent on building the physique that I wanted to look a certain way but I made sure to spend about 20% of my time incorporating these moves that we're going to make sure that I still stayed pretty functional. Mm -hmm. But being an expert in one or the other is going to hinder the other one, no matter how you how you wrap it up. Yeah. I think, I, I it think, reminds me, too, of when um, like w when I was training for football and like the coach specifically like 
told me, he's like, look, you have to gain at least 20 pounds, you know, for this new position to be inside linebacker. And I was like, oh my God, I got to put on a lot of mass. So, you know, being young and, and impressionable and looking towards other people to give me ideas, like all summer I trained like a bodybuilder and all I did was hypertrophy and style training and, and, you know, didn't go through full range of motion and, um, just got really good and, and, put on size like I got I got bigger significantly but uh, going into play like as far as like my movement was concerned and um you know how I how I was balanced and uh man it was it was a just a striking difference and it's because of like you said it's not it wasn't even 80 20 it was like you know like 99 percent uh hypertrophy a little bit of movement incorporation but yeah you have to really establish uh, what that looks like in your programming. So if, uh, you know, if my, my priority was to, to be more explosive and, um, you know, respond better and be balanced and, and have, uh, you know, better body awareness, you know, I would have focused way more on the functional style training, but, uh, there, there's somewhere in there. We need to figure that out, how to kind of twist the knobs that, that will specifically, well, make this it is, optimal. this is where we, I mean, this is what really motivated us to do the sexy athlete bundle, mm-hmm. right? Was okay. How would we, how would this look for us? And you know that that's a blend of black and green together. So maps black, which is maps aesthetics, and maps green, which is map performance, and it's a blend of the two. And even though it's a blend, we set out all the programming. It's it's really designed for you to have the ability to kind of flip flop those. So you can make your foundational stuff more maps black, and then your off days. Um, mobility days. So then you, you're spending, you know, three of the days of the week are building and, and shaping the body. Then the other two are staying mobile and active like that, full range of motion and multi-planar movements. Or if you're more athlete, but then you still want to get a little bit of aesthetic training, then you would flip it on its head and go three days of the week is more maps green and you're focused. Those are your foundational days because you're getting all that functional training. And then the other two days are kind of hypertrophy or what it would be called focus sessions. So I think people... There's this misconception when it comes to muscle and training in that when you train muscles for functionality, somehow it's the muscle itself uh, that is different. Here's the, here's, the, here's the truth. There's a smart and a dumb side to uh, training your muscles. The, the dumb side is the muscle itself. Stronger, more endurance, you know, utilizing energy better, contracting faster, slower. Okay. There's that side, which is the dumb side. Then there's this smart, complicated, interconnected side that has to do with your central nervous system, muscle recruitment patterns, your how your brain uh, controls muscles to move them in, mm-hmm. in particular ways. That's a skill. The, the, if I took the muscle from a highly competitive athlete and the muscle from a bodybuilder and I took a chunk out and I looked at them. Well, the same. Uh, I mean – and let's say they were both in strength sports, so that because bodybuilders obviously train a lot more in strength, they're going to look the same. The difference is the athlete is more skilled. Mm-hmm. So really, think of functional muscle as skilled muscle, yeah. not even the muscle, just having skill. Because that's a great point to bring up the central nervous system, because it is it's, it's all in like what you're teaching your body, and that's that's, that's your command center. So. That's it. I mean, look, if I if I took if you took a person and you just had them ride a bike all the time and they never ever walked ever again their skill at walking would diminish. Mm -hmm. Now, would that mean that their muscles are smaller, less developed, less fit? No. It's just the skill of walking. Your body will actually lose uh, its sharpness in its skills. If you look at highly, highly skilled sports that require extremely high levels of you know, proprioceptive ability and skill and don't don't necessarily require tons and tons and tons of athletic ability, you'll see that they train a shit ton of skill. If you look at uh, like synchronized uh, swimmers or divers, for example, yes, they're very fit, but the vast majority of the training is practicing over and over again, hammering in these movements to where they develop these neural patterns, to where they, they know their position in space while they're jumping off the diving board and they know how to spin, they know how to go head first, create the small splash, all these different things. That's what functionality is. Functionality is skill more than anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, muscles can get very fit. Functionality has to do with skill. So don't forget that. So that means that if you go in the gym and train for functionality, 
you're training for certain levels of fitness. You're training so some muscles can communicate. But don't forget your sport. Like, mm -hmm. if you're not out in the field practicing what you're doing, like, I can get a basketball player and train him to be super basketball fit all day long. Yeah. But if he never plays basketball, he's got no functionality. Right. You'll see a diminishing return once, you know, like the mass sort of impedes on on your, your movement. Like, right? So, like, if I'm... If I'm to a point where, uh, you know, maybe I, maybe I have been like neglecting some of the skill portion of, of training, but, um, you know, I've, I've accelerated, uh, the amount of mass I've put on my body and the weight distribution, like you're going to have to adjust to that. So there's this sort of period where, um, you know, it's important to, to really kind of reestablish that skill and focus on that for a while. But, you know, like you can get bigger and still move effectively. You just have to be able to prioritize. Well, that. let's talk about how we would apply that because, okay, now, of course, we created a program for this. But let's, right. pretend, let's pretend you don't own the program. You have no intention of buying it. You're just here to get free shit from us. So this is what I would tell someone is that, okay, I got seven days in the week. You're an athlete and you want to look a certain way. Look at it at seven days. So out of the seven days, like, and Sal hit it perfect. Like, if your priority is to be very good at this sport, you know, ideally we're we're mimicking the movements that you would be doing within your sport almost daily, right? And every day that we decide we're not going to do that, we're going to replace it with chasing this muscle building or aesthetic look that I want. So maybe five days out of the week, if I'm, if I want to be mostly a badass athlete, but I would like to shape a little bit of my body as far as building some mass, right? I would be spending five days of my week doing all like say, we'll do is basketball since it's my wheelhouse is okay. I'm playing basketball or doing basketball like drills, plyometric type movements or mimicking moves that would be the same that I would be doing on the court five of the seven days, two of those days I'm, I'm off the court and I'm doing weightlifting, a weightlifting routine, probably a full body routine where I'm training for hypertrophy or strength on those days. And then based off my goal would be on how much more weightlifting I would do versus uh, sports. Mm -hmm. Now, if the sport is important, but not as important as your the way you look and you're building muscle, well, then maybe three, four days of the week creeps in the weightlifting and two or three of the days now is only sports. So you just got to, you have to really decide where your priorities are, but I mean, nothing is going to make you better at your sport than playing your sport and mimicking drills that are related to your sport. And I'm not, nothing's going to build more. And muscle I'm glad you're bringing this up. You said what you just said right now, because I'll have people who will tell me like, Oh yeah, I used to box. And then, you know, I decided I wanted to get real strong and powerful. So I started doing lots of weightlifting and then I lost my, my timing and my boxing was off and I realized that weights isn't good for boxing. I'm like, no, that's not what happened. Yeah. What happened is, is you started lifting weights, built muscle and stopped boxing a lot mm -hmm. and your body's different. It's bigger. you got more muscle and you just, you can't move as well because you're not used to this new body. Mm -hmm. You have to train at the you same time. You the same time. That's the point. You yeah, have to. The, I, the central nervous system is crucial to be able to produce uh, the type All of that movement. movement that you need to, to produce. So Look, if you're not training it, like it's the quality is going to go down. I'll tell you what, you take any athlete, if I could magically snap my fingers, take any athlete and add 10 pounds of muscle and with, with added strength, Yeah, most people would be like, oh, that's better for the sport. No. Imagine if right now instantly you gain 10 pounds. Now start walking around, moving around. You're going to feel a little off. Right. Your, your timing is going to be off. Your movement's going to be off. You're not used to your new body. You have to recalibrate. Exactly. So uh, skill is, when it comes to functionality, skill is like the primo most important thing. Yep. Lucas Hunt 10. Any tips to stay on heels throughout the entire duration of a standard barbell squat? Oh, this will be good because we are about to shoot a series coming up soon here on the YouTube channel. So if you guys are not subscribed to the YouTube channel, it's Mind Pump TV on YouTube. We were about to hit 10,000 subscribers if we're not there already. And every single day we drop a new video. A lot of times we do these series. Right now we're running a series with Stephanie uh, on gut health and posture and some things like that. I think Sal went with her. Uh, so this will be a series I wanted to do anyway. So let's talk about uh, what's probably going on with somebody whose heels are coming up off the ground. Yeah, the mm. For the average person, when I would take a client on and I'd do an assessment and I would notice that their heels would come up off the floor, the most common reasons that I would see this is uh, would be two. two. Two of the common reasons would be that they weren't able to sit back in their squat so their hips weren't firing. So when they would squat, rather than sitting back, their knees would come forward to get lots of knee flexion, 
which would then require lots of uh, ankle mobility, ankle yeah. mobility <laughs> which, you know, after a certain point, your ankle is only going to, you know, dorsiflex so much and you're going, your heels are going to come up off the floor. So when I would have them stick their butt back and learn how to sit back and activate the hips, many times I still, I wouldn't see their ankles come up off the floor. The second reason, less common, but still quite common, was because they didn't have good ankle mobility, and a lot of it was because they had tightness in their soleus or their gastrox, their calves. Yeah. And you see this more commonly in uh, women who wear high heels. Mm -hmm. High heels, what you're literally doing when you're wearing high heels is you are shortening your calf muscles all day long yeah, and you're learning reflection all day long all day and you're learning to walk everything is anterior focus <laughs> and, yeah and you're walking on the balls of your feet your calves are constantly shortened throughout the entire day then when you go take your shoes off now you go to you know lengthen the gastroc it's but a your hamstrings and ass look great in them yeah <laughs> that's true <laughs> just saying um mm. it, it, that's why they're they're so popular right <laughs> yeah. but you now that you go to flatten your feet out those things are tight and you'll hear women complain of uh plantar fasciitis mm. um or you'll notice that they're they're when they walk their feet will turn out quite a bit so they get that external rotation at the hip because they have tight, you know, tight hips. A lot of people will say, "Oh, that's a dancer. Dancers walk like that." No, that's not good to walk like that with your feet pointed out. Mm -hmm. um, so, in those two situations, I'd get the hips to fire better, and I would lengthen, uh, lengthen the calves. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say I'd definitely say that ankle mobility for me. I, I think the most common for sure ankle mobility, um, which having tight calves tight soleus is going to limit that right so that's that's the obvious one is to stretch the calves out but then really to do and we did a whole series also on the youtube channel of you know ankle mobility and i, I know we did at least three or four videos on that where i did some drills uh combat stretch we used the wall and some other things um and i just shot some more with uh jordan recently too so there's some good ankle uh ankle mobility stuff on there so i think that's a must the other time i see it too is sometimes people have an excessive forward lean mm. in their squat which can be caused from the the, the mm. type tight hip flexors and then their body kind of falls over and then when their weight falls over and the barbell comes over when they're squatting uh, a lot of times their weight will shift forward onto the balls of their feet and then their heels will, will tend to come off the ground. Now a crutch for that is like using squat shoes. I mean, that's what squat shoes help you with, right? It elevates the the heel a little bit and then it allows you to sink into the mm -hmm. the squat, which, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm back and forth on m my feeling on the squat shoes. I think that it's it, like anything else, it's a tool. And if somebody has a really hard time keeping their heels flat on the ground, it's a, it's a, a nice place to start knowing that the goal is to get rid of them and be on flat, be flat. Because I think we tell people to be flat and then to go into that position and then they, they continue to wanting to squat and then could end up hurting themselves or they just can't seem to stay back on their heels because they're just not there yet. So this is when you see people using the squat shoes. This is why it's helping them. But it's just keep that in mind if it's a tool that you're going to use that ultimately – you need to address the ankles and make sure that you have enough travel. So yeah, all this tightness and uh, obviously that's like kind of the first part of like a squat assessment is, you know, assessing all these types of things like where muscles may be uh, getting too loud of a signal. And definitely, you know, the calves are are way active, you know, and they're they're taking they're, they're short and they're taking up a lot of uh, the attention. And also, you know, with the the quads being dominant, um, you know, an individual like this with with the heels raising, um, you know, th these are all things that um, you're, you're going to have to assess like on a day to day basis, like what you're doing and what kind of patterns you're establishing constantly. And so maybe it's with heels, maybe it's just the way that you walk, maybe it's the way that you you squat down and you pick things up or you, you go to like, you know, sit on the toilet, you know, all these kinds of things. If you can start kind of hacking your way through all these things and, and, and start like teaching your body how to be more, uh, you know, utilize, you know, your, your, your heels being flat while you go to kind of sit back and, and, and activate your posterior chain. So really learning how to activate your posterior chain and get it more involved um, and, uh, one thing that, uh, I tend to do too, if like my calves, you know, are, are, are very tight and, 
uh, I like to do like a downward facing dog and, and kind of walk my hands back. So I, I'm just focused on trying to smash my heel down mm. in that position and then hold a nice static stretch there, kind of back off, hold a nice static stretch there. Sometimes I'll walk uh, into it doing like an inchworm or something like that where um, that's my focus is, you know, like if I notice that that's, that's an issue in my squad, I'm going to, I'm going to address it like that. You so, know, when, when, for me, first off, you should be able to sit in a squat, uh, bottomed out, feet flat, comfortable. So that's a goal. Not everybody can do it, but you should be able to do that. That's a natural human movement. Most people can't. So work towards that. But in terms of, you know, when we're talking about the heels coming up, I, probably what's more common with uh, people who train regularly, it probably isn't necessarily tight calves or bat or that their hips aren't firing if they've been training for a long time. And this is something I learned rather recently. Uh, it's poor foot connection because mm -hmm. I, uh, I could squat before with squat shoes. Um, I, I would do okay with them. Then when I took them off, I'd notice I had issues and I thought it was my ankles. I thought it was my hips. It was neither of those. It was my feet. They weren't, I wasn't connected to the floor of my feet. It was like they were just disconnected and it was like my body started at my ankles and up. And so because my feet were disconnected, the way my ankles would flex and everything would, you know, all the way up the chain, it would cause this, this, uh, these, these deviations in my, in, in my form. So now that I'm more connected with my feet, I squat barefoot mm -hmm. and I can get down pretty low and my heels stay flat and hips fire. But it took me a while to really get to learn how to like uh, ground really yeah. well with my feet. So walking around the house barefoot and, and, and really like, you know, like feeling your way through each, each strike on the ground and, and getting and, more connected. And even while ankles. I, while I squat, like I used to, when I used to squat, I didn't even think about my feet. I mm -hmm. just I just squatted. Like I thought about my hips. I thought about my back. It's my true. Core, yeah, we get really disconnected from I, the feet. I, I didn't think about my toes. I didn't think about my, the muscles at the bottom of my feet. Now, when I squat, as I'm going down, especially as I get lower, I literally ground and activate my feet and my toes, and I spread them, and I make sure my ankles in good position. But it all starts with my feet, and it changes everything. And my opinion on things like squat shoes and belts has changed so fucking dramatically. Like yeah. In, uh, my view now is unless you compete uh, in events that, that, that allow those types of things, like if you're a power lifter, you should train with a belt and you got to learn how to use it. If you can wear squat shoes and they allow those and you're good with them, that's fine. If you're, if you're not, if you're the average person who just wants to build muscle and get fit, uh, number one, uh, it takes time to be able to do these things without uh, these apparatuses. So give yourself some time, but your goal should be to train with nothing and to feel most comfortable with nothing because that's just how you walk or that's how you are throughout the day. And it's what's going to make you the most healthy. And it's what's going to give you the most control and stability of your body without having to have anything help you out. And whereas in the past, my opinion was a little like, Oh, you know, wear a belt if you lift real heavy and squatting with squat shoes is okay. And now that I've gone away from those, it's taken me a long time. Mm -hmm. I can see how, um, like, why? Why would I train those patterns in my body? Right, because you're not always dependent on it. Exactly. Like, I don't, I'm not competing in anything. There's no reason for me to learn to get my body to, to move with these things. So just take them off, and I never... I never use those things anymore. Something else that we we kind of missed is that we I'm sure we all use. I know I use this with clients that have this issue is um, box squats yeah, box and squats, and yeah. goblet squats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So goblet squats uh, and box squats are a great way to help people, you know, get get connected, sit up, sit up with the chest up, sit back on those heels. Uh, so that's also a tool. So what I would start doing with someone is dealing with, dealing with all the, the mobility stuff. So I'd be addressing all the ankle mobility, getting connected to the feet, like Sal was saying. And then I would replace my barbell back squats uh, with some goblet squats and box, box squats until I start getting everything firing properly. And then once I can get myself uh, into that position comfortably, I have better mobility, then I would go back to progressing the weight on my barbell squats. This is some of the stuff too, just so you guys know, um, if you're not already signed up for the 30 days of free coaching, like we have 30 days of free coaching where we get into mobility and strength training. Uh, I think that's in the second or the third week, but that's absolutely free to everybody. So if you have not, as soon as you get on the website, pop-up comes up, you just put your name and email in. And then every day you get dripped an email that's related to the first week is related to nutrition. Then we get in resistance training, we get into mobility stuff. So all these things get addressed and we go deeper into each topic. So 
you know, sign up for the 30 days of free coaching if you guys haven't done that already. Healthy, happy, and free. Is sugar from fruit different from other sugar? Sure. This is a great question. So uh, on a chemical level... What are they? What is the number? What? Are, how many total different types of sugar? What is it, 80-something? Oh, 84, I like, so I think I read that somewhere in the in the grocery store. There's like over 84 different types of sugars. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's, like, it's a fucking ridiculous... It's a number higher than I even... I had any clue. Yeah, I didn't know that. See, I'm familiar with the common, you know... Yeah, the big ones, right? Yeah, that yeah, we... Yeah. That we... That was at four, five, mm -hmm. right? So, but there's... they Now there's so many... Uh, you know, spinoffs from the corn syrup and all the different. Are you googling it right now? Yeah, I'm looking what up it? all the different kinds of ways that they can label sugar and put sugar in the market. And hmm. you know, this. I'll what's tell you what. I'll tell you say? what. It's like, I thought it was 80 something. I thought it was like high. So I don't crazy. know. I, I'll tell you why this is. A, I, I mean, know, maybe the, I made the common. Up. The common ones like fructose, galactose, glucose, mm -hmm. sucrose. Uh, but I, I tell you why I like this question. Uh, it's a great question because it's kind of a trick question. Like, if I took the sugar from a fruit, if I extracted the fructose from a fruit and I compared it to sugar that's in a cookie or a fructose that we made in a lab or something like that. And I compared them the same. It's the same chemical structure. The difference is it's what, paired to stuff. Yeah. What is the vehicle that it's coming yeah. in? Okay. What, what is it coming in? Like if I take sugar and extract it from fruit, uh, high fructose corn syrup, add it to your soda, that's very different than eating yeah. an apple or a banana. Something um, that has like a, a fiber or like, you know, something else attached to some kind of nutrient attached to it. There's a lot, there's a lot I mean, incredible benefits to eating fruit. Uh, there's fiber. There's, they're high in nutrients. Um, I will say this, though. Fruit isn't the same as it used to be. Uh, you know, yeah, we, true. we've changed fruit quite a bit. A banana today looks very different than a banana, you know, 200 years ago. Um, there, 200 years ago, bananas were full of seeds. There was very little meat. It was low in... It was much lower in in sugar. We've bred them to be like these super delicious, mm -hmm. you know, uh, kind of sugar bombs, if you will. Same thing with apples and you know all the um, all the common fruits, right? We've we've basically bred the hell out of them to make them sweeter with less fiber and less. And we've needed you know, more pesticides to make this possible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because of course, if we like the fruit because it's sweeter, so, yeah. so do the bugs. So do the bugs. Um, but that being said. Can you overeat fruit? Yeah, but it's not nearly as likely as you eating overeating sugar from processed foods. Um, that seems to be much more common. Like rarely do have I had a client who's like, oh, you know, yesterday for lunch I ate, you know, 10 fruits, you know, t you know, I ate five apples and two bananas. It's pretty rare that people will do that in a day. But I've had many clients come to me and be like, I had 10 cookies, you know, at lunch. Yeah. So, yeah. so when I tell people to avoid sugar, I rarely, rarely ever tell them to avoid fruit um, unless there's a specific reason. Let's say they're they're eating keto, or you know, there's a specific reason that we're avoiding sugar. But if it's just you know, I'm trying to modify someone's nutrition to make them healthier, I tell people to avoid added sugar and processed and refined sugar. I don't tell them to avoid is this, fruit for the most th part. Was this the same person that referenced me talking about the grams of sugar in the past that I talked about on the show? I think so. I have some I have some general rules that I do when I'm co coaching with people. And mind you, everybody is different. The numbers that I'm saying right now are completely arbitrary because like, cause everyone's unique, weight, size, sex, movement, all that shit matters, right? But uh, over the years and years and years of coaching thousands of people and diving into people's diets and seeing habits, I've I've found that I have kind of this general rule that I teach people. Um, and the first one is it's really easy to get uh, over 25 grams of sugar in your diet, like real quick. A banana has like 32 grams, mm -hmm. okay? Um, so what I tell a client is this, like aside from fruit, I don't want you to get any more than 25 grams of sugar. So not including fruit, you know, 25 grams, under 25 grams of sugar from anything else, which believe it or not, that's really easy to get. People don't realize so much shit that's processed has added sugar that you wouldn't realize, like bread or ketchup or mm -hmm. random things that you don't consider sweets yes. have yeah. all this added sugar. Yes. I so I tell them to stay under 25 grams aside from fruits. Now, if we are like fruit lovers, I have lots of fruit lovers that I've trained. I say, okay, well, our goal is to get a majority of your fruit intake is going to come from berries, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, strawberries. 
Your berries are your biggest bang for your buck. The highest in antioxidants, the highest in fiber, the lowest in sugar. You're getting you're getting that that the taste that most people are chasing when they want that sweet taste. You're getting tons of benefits from it with the antioxidants, with the fiber, and then you're ke- keeping the calories and the sugar pretty minimal. Considering now, does that mean you can't have a, an apple, or does that mean that those those aren't good for you? No, banana's great for you. Apple's great for you. But I teach my clients to cycle those other fruits in as like for enjoyment. If you're out at the pool and you love watermelon, by all means, enjoy yourself. Have some fucking watermelon that day. Or you're out at, and you're in the banana is convenient that day for you to peel it open and eat it. By all means, eat that. But if I had a client that every day has two apples and two bananas, I'd be like, well, let's change the fruit choices. Let's get things that are more beneficial, lower, lower calorie, more antioxidants. And I'd say more berries. So that's how I teach clients is listen, under 25 grams on all other sugars. If it's fruit, enjoy your fruit, but be mindful of the fruit that you're choosing. If you're always choosing bananas, apples, pineapples, grapes, the ones that are higher in sugar with less benefits. Melons. Try and try and see awful, right? (laughs) Very little benefits. So yeah, your, your cantaloupes, your watermelons, your most melons are very, very little benefit to them in comparison to uh, berries and things like that. Mm So your berries are your biggest bang for your buck. I tell them to shoot for that a majority of the fruits you're consuming and then enjoy your apple and banana and grapes occasionally as you as you consume, but yeah. there's no reason to stress over. Yeah, sugar is a very interesting uh, subject because, I mean, you know, through brain imaging, we can see how especially refined uh, forms of sugar cause uh, very, very rapid and large uh, uh, rises in dopamine in the brain. We see in obese individuals when they, especially those that are insulin, uh, insulin um, that have insulin issues or insulin sensitivity issues, we see that their brain actually produces, le- uh, actually has down-regulated dopamine receptors from eating sugar, which is cl- these are like hallmarks of uh, of addiction. Like this will happen with drugs. So you're, you you get lots of dopamine. Uh, you your 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 brain wants more of it. It starts to down-regulate receptors. So now it perceives. The same amount of dopamine is less, so now it craves even more dopamine, and sugar is just an easy way when it comes to food to get that big dopamine rush. Now, to be fair, all very palatable foods cause a dopamine release. However, your uh, body's you know natural breaks, right? The things that n- will naturally tell you to stop eating, feeling full, or you know, kind of. You know, when you eat too much of something, even if it tastes good, you'll get to the point where you'll kind of be like, oh, I'm sick of it. Mm-hmm. That happens less with sugar than it does with other things. Like foods that are high in fat are also quite palatable, but you don't see people like binging on, you know, butter uh, or, I mean, butter's delicious, but I, you know, I don't, I don't see people, it's not quite as common to binge on butter like you would on something that's with lots of sugar. <laughs> Your body doesn't put the brakes on as quickly when it comes to the binge again. <laughs> That's why we talk about sugar. You know, you know who just did a really, if you don't follow, hold on, let me, I'm going to look it up right now because we're, this is perfect for what we're talking about right now. And I know this goes up right away. Um, Rob Wolf just did a cool post on this, like uh, exactly what you're talking about right now. Did you see his post? No, it's his latest post right now. So Rob, uh, Rob Wolf, which his Instagram name is, was it Doss? It's Darso Dars or Doss Doss Rob Wolf. That's what it is. So D A S R O B B W O L F. So um, that's all one word. Um, is Rob Wolf. Check him out. His last video he just posted, and he's comparing the different uh, chocolate bars. And there's like a 90% dark talk chocolate and then two other bars and then Cadbury eggs. Mm. And he's actually explaining exactly uh, the, how your palate uh, will handle each one of these and the amount that your body will allow you basically to consume. Mm-hmm. And it goes right hand in hand with what mm. you're discussing right now. So it's a good example of that and a good write-up. So make sure you're following it. Yeah, it's off. just, again, pay attention. I mean, if I were, if, when I tell people, like if I had one thing to tell people that would make a decent impact on their health and their fitness and their fat you know, body fat storage and all that stuff. And I only had to pick one. Uh, obviously, there's lots of factors. But if I just had to pick one thing, I tell people avoid, just avoid sugar. And that tends to make a pretty big difference. If I had to, like, again, if I had to pick one thing, that's the one thing I would pick. Mm. Steph Burns, how many grams of protein should you aim for when you're protein fasting? 
uh, we should, said protein is, is, farting. It really. looks like that. Is, it, <laughs> isn't that an oxymoron? Like, wow. Is that an oxymoron? <laughs> how, do you, how many how many grams of protein do you need for protein fasting? Yeah, yeah. Is, that a, yeah. is that what you call an oxymoron? Is that uh, what an oxymoron is? I think an oxymoron yeah. is when you have. Like yeah, big, I guess. Yeah, it's not technically yeah. fasting. Yeah, yeah you're you're still still protein fasting. To eat protein. Fat. Yeah, yeah. It'd be Minimizing would be a better. It's like word. little big yeah. league, right? So, yeah, exactly. Jumbo shrimp. Yeah. So you know, let's talk about this about what protein fasting is and why this is becoming a thing and will become a larger thing. It's funny because we talked we we touched upon this with Rob, didn't we? We touched about we on Rob Wolf's interview, but we talked about this ourselves a while ago. I believe I brought this up oh, a long probably a time. year and a half yeah, ago. Yeah, no, you talked about this way, way long ago and, I, and, and I, called out that this would be the trend that this will be the thing because we treat protein like it's the mac uh, the the magic macronutrient and that, you know, cut carbs sometimes, cut fat sometimes. Overeating, you know, carbs can be bad. Overeating fat can be bad, but, but you never protein. Want to get rid of that protein. Yeah, protein's always consistent. Always eat a high amount. Don't worry about it. It's the greatest thing ever. Yeah. You cannot. And if not, you got to supplement with amino acids. Yeah, exactly. Like, oh, if you're gonna fast, make sure you get amino acids because you have to have those, you know, amino acids for the proteins. Uh, protein fasting is coming from studies that show that uh, low protein, low carbohydrate diets. There's a there's something called a fasting mimicking diet, which is low protein, low low carbohydrate, um, is showing many or the same benefits as fasting. So it's the protein and carbohydrates that fuel some of these functions in the body that you want to kind of stop for a second that make the body get rid of. Like when you don't take those things in, your body will kill older cells. It'll go through a, a process of apoptosis. Then you, when you refeed, refeed the body, you build up these new cells and you get like this regeneration uh, it's very good for you. It's good for the body. Well, this happens when you protein fast as well. Uh, there's also studies to show that um, if you eat high protein all the time, you can actually desensitize your body to protein to where it's not utilizing it as efficiently as it could be. And here's something you want to take you want to take note of. You want your body to be pretty efficient with food. Mm -hmm. I know all, all, we talk about speeding up your metabolism and being able to eat more and more food and burn more calories and be lean which is great in the sense of modern times because we're surrounded by food and it's great to have a faster metabolism so you don't gain weight. But on the flip side, you don't necessarily want to be able to eat a shit ton of food and because you're burning so many calories because more food isn't always better. You know what I'm saying? There's still a process of well, this is digesting it. There's still an inflammatory process. There's still you know, yeah. detriment. There's eventually just detriment, even if you're burning it, to eating more and more food. You want to to keep your body sensitive to in to you know carbohydrates, fats, and protein. When I protein fast, which it's exactly what it sounds like, it's a protein fast. Is and for me, I don't really I don't go on full blown protein fast. Basically, what I do is, and it's kind of like Sal's vegan days. I just decide that this day I'm going to go mostly all vegetables and greens. And I really don't give a shit about protein. I'm not looking at a gram or target. I know that I'm going to be grossly under what my you know RDA is for protein, but I don't care because I don't eat that. With 99% of the time, I'm always getting enough protein or over protein. So the whole idea or concept of protein fasting is to limit yourself or take some away. So for me, I'm going to avoid it, and I'm going to. And really, what I do is I just avoid it from meats. Like I'm staying away from the meats and things like that. And I'm, yeah, it's, I'm going to get it probably in some of my eggs that morning, and some nuts and seeds in my salad that I end up having later on the day. And that probably ends up being somewhere between thirty and fifty grams of protein for a day, which yep. for me is extremely low because I'm eating closer to like two hundred grams. Mm -hmm. So. I'm not really technically fully fasting from protein. I'm still getting it in other places. But the idea is that, like, you know, if I'm oversaturating myself with protein all the time, that I'm going to take a day or two, you know, every other week that I'm going to completely not even worry about it and go. So I think getting caught up in how many grams of protein that you should consume on that, well, if you're if you're doing protein fasting and your idea is to take it away from the body the lower you go, the better. Like, I mean, the less you decide. And one day of absolutely no protein is not going to kill you. Yeah. It's essential, but it doesn't mean that you have to have it every single day. And it, in fact, it would probably do well for you to have a day that's extremely low. I, I highly recommend if you are the typical, you know, person that lifts weights and, you know, is trying to build muscle and look more fit, you probably eat a lot of protein. Mm -hmm. you, 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 in, now, if you're not eating excessive, ridiculous amounts of protein, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with eating... You know, around a one gram uh, of protein per pound of body weight. 
most of the time. But you need to realize that that's a high that's high protein. That's more than you need to function uh, and you know to, to for your body to function. You're eating the upper limit of protein because you're trying to build more muscle. Nothing wrong with that. However, you uh, in particular, I'm talking to you, the person who eats uh, you know a high protein diet. Probably will benefit from the the most from having. I was just going to say. I them. think the, if the, if we can speak to anybody right now, it's my peers. Yeah, yeah. they'll the benefit body, the most from the this. men's physique, the bodybuilding, the bikini girls. Like you know, who's going to benefit the most from hearing this are you guys. If you have been on this regimen and your coach or whoever's been fucking telling you you're one point five to two grams of, of protein for God knows how long, guess what? Flip it on its head and mm-hmm. avoid protein like the plague for a day or two, and then go back and see how much. Better. Yeah, you have to just keep voicing the performance benefits to it for for it to really sink into that type of uh, person and their mentality. Because I mean, it only makes logical sense that if you want to be uh, more sensitive to that macronutrient, you know, you have to go through phases where you know you're not like constantly saturated with it. It just makes sense. Otherwise, what do you do? Like, I mean, let's use coffee as, a, as a, an example of that, where you get to a certain level where I need like three cups a day. And, uh, you know, what's what's left? Like, to do four? You, like, come you, on, let's calm down. You can use even another macronutrient. Use carbohydrates. Yeah. Pay attention to somebody who eats 400 grams of carbs every single day. It's the take, same fucking thing. Take exactly. it away yeah, from, why would take it be it, any different? Take it away from them for a while and then reintroduce it. And every bodybuilder that's listening to this right now that's carb-cycled knows what the fuck that feels like. Why does it feel so awesome on refeed day? Because you just it's not because there's something special about the three or 400 grams you had on refeed day. It's that you took it away for fucking yeah, two, and, two or three days. And as great as that feels, that's what you'll feel when you do a little bit of protein cycling. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's absolutely it's true. It's a look, novel concept. Look, if yeah. you have an engine engine and you're pumping out 300 horsepower and you discover that within this engine there's all these leaks where all this energy this combustion is coming out and it's not being compressed properly you can pump more gas into that or you can shut those leaks off and make it more efficient and much more powerful well what happens when you consume tons of protein consistently seven days seven days a week 365 days a year which i i I guarantee you a lot of the people listening right now do that. I guarantee a lot of people listening right now never have a day where their protein goes below a certain number. They are inefficient at utilizing it. So your body is, you know, not wasting the protein you're eating, but it's not really utilizing it as if, no, it's not optimizing it for muscle building. Throw in a day, like let's say you're a guy and you're eating 200 grams of protein every single day. Okay. Throw in a day where you have 100 grams of protein and throw in a day where you have 50 grams of protein. Just Throw them in there randomly. Not only are you not going to lose muscle, but what you may actually notice are improved gains. Here's what you for sure will notice. Better digestion, better health, more room for other healthy foods. Like the, the, the good less, thing- Less blow. Less blow, like less inflammation. Uh, you may notice improvements in your skin and your, your energy. Your won't be as horrific. <laughs> you know what's funny is that- for some reason, people accept like the putrid, horrible fart <laughs> smell as like, oh, it's this. Oh, it's part of my gains yeah, process, it's, it's bro. It's just normal. No, that's actually a sign that you may you may yeah. be a little yeah. off with your nutrition. Like, uh, I make unhealthy. I make gains just as good now, and my farts don't smell aren't nearly as bad as they used to be <laughs> when I was consuming tons of protein. So, if you're one of those people eating all that protein. I tell you what, uh, one of the best things you could do, and of course, this doesn't mean you eat shitty, by the way. This doesn't mean your you're low-protein day that you go and eat a bunch of crap. Mm. Uh, still eat healthy, but just don't worry about your protein, um, and you'll find your focus will go more towards probably vegetables, which is a good thing. Mm-hmm. Throw it in there every once in a while. You won't lose gains, I promise you. You'll be absolutely fine, and you may notice some uh, incredible benefits, and you'll save money. Protein's expensive, so try that out. Hey, check this out. Go to mindpumpmedia.com. Adam talked about the 30 days of coaching earlier in this episode. It's still available, and it's still for free. Also, go to Instagram. You can look at our page, Mind Pump Radio. It's awesome. You can find my personal page at Mind Pump Sal. Adam's at Mind Pump Adam, and Justin's at Mind Pump Justin. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. 
With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.